Hello, and welcome to today's talk on running lean architectures and how to optimize for cost efficiency. Man, this conference is huge. I just read that we have 13,500 people sitting here in Las Vegas learning about AWS and uh, figuring out architectures and networking with each other. And uh, this, is, this is a great opportunity for us to show you ways on how to save more money. And in fact, there are so many ways to save money on AWS that we will use all of the 45 minutes to show you these ways. And then after that, we will have some time for questions back in the hall. My name is Konstantin Gonzalez. I'm a solutions architect with AWS in Munich in Germany. And in my day-to-day -day job, I work with customers putting together their architectures, helping them with architecture patterns. And also, I help them save money on AWS. So what you're going to get out of this session is, of course, you're going to get a lower AWS bill. So my personal goal is that each and every one of you should be able to lower your bill by at least 10% as a result of this talk. And please let me know if you don't lower your bill, and then I'll go dig up some new methods for you to try out. <laughs> you're also going to see ways on how to get a more scalable, robust, and more dynamic architecture. Because sometimes a cost-cutting measure or something that helps you be more efficient can also help you with being more scalable, more robust, and more dynamic. And some of these strategies will also help you spend more time innovating and less time worrying about your architectures. We're going to see some real-life customer examples. And most of these things are pretty easy to implement. So you can start right away saving money after you get out of this talk. So when you look at the cloud computing benefits, you will probably notice that three out of six cloud computing benefits have directly to do something with cost. So cost is a big driver for people to go to the cloud, but it's also all about being more innovative, being, have more agility, and focus on your business, which are all things that also indirectly will contribute to you making more money or you saving more money. So let's start looking at ways to optimize for cost. And it turns out that the number one strategy could be do nothing. How does it work? Well, <laughs> actually, it is our job to bring down prices a lot. Because whenever AWS reduces prices, we see more customers using our infrastructure. And the more customers use our infrastructure, the, the more AWS users we, we see. And there are some factors who contribute there. There's a large ecosystem of other customers and partners using AWS. There are new features and new services that we just launched, which will bring even more customers into AWS. So we see a lot of AWS usage, and it increases over time, so that we get to build more infrastructure. Now, the more infrastructure we get to build, the better we can leverage economies of scale. That means we get to build the better data centers that help us, in turn, lower infrastructure costs even more. And this is where infrastructure innovation comes into play. Has anybody of you seen James Hamilton's talk yesterday? Man, he's a great speaker. If you haven't, please look him up on YouTube. Check out his talk around what he does in terms of infrastructure innovation, which, again, helps us bring down infrastructure costs even more so that we can start reducing prices even more. And so far, we have reduced prices 45 times since AWS was born. And we will continue lowering prices for our customers, even if you don't do anything. Now, the second strategy could be for you to do almost nothing. And that means if you book AWS support, if you book business support or enterprise support, you get access to AWS Trusted Advisor for free. So Trusted Advisor will scan your infrastructure, and it will give you a report. And that report will tell you new ways to save money. So as a result of spending some money with support, and it's 10% or less of your bill, you will get access to Trusted Advisor, which will help you save more money. So many times, Trusted Advisor alone will pay for itself so that you basically get support for free. But of course, you're here to learn more about architecture. So let's look at some other steps you can take to optimize your architecture and to save more money. Another interesting thing here is when you build IT the old way, then you have this cycle of plan, build, run, right? And each of these steps takes months to complete in the old world. And the trouble with the old world of IT is, once you build something and once it's running, it's very hard to change. 
Actually, it costs a lot of money if you make some mistake in the plan, in the build, in the architecture phase, so that you will spend a lot of money just to make up for your errors. In contrast, if you look at AWS and the way we architect here, it becomes a cycle. So you can architect your, put together your architecture, you can build your architecture, then you can monitor your architecture, and it doesn't have to be super 100% right the first time. You can get started with some architecture that works for you, and then you can continue iterating. You can monitor your architecture, figure out what is the biggest cost block in my architecture, optimize that, architect around that, build it into your architecture, improve all the time, and it all happens in a matter of minutes. You can change your architecture in a matter of minutes, and you can optimize all the time. So that changes a lot of the fundamental cost management process, because you're no longer tied to anything that you need to write off over three to five years. So let's look at some strategies for architecting for low cost, and we broke this down into seven easy steps for you. Step number one, and the easiest way to save money is turn off unused instances. You will be amazed at how many instances are running there doing nothing that you can leverage and that you can save a lot of cost with. So that means, for instance, developer instances, test instances, training instances, all of these instances can be switched off over the weekend or they can be switched off over the night. You can use the simple start-stop feature of EC2 to turn off instances and then turn them back on again without losing your, your data on EBS volumes, for instance. Or you can build whole architectures using automation and tear them down altogether when you don't use them. So there is no longer the notion of buying hardware and then being stuck with it. You think of instances as, as something that is disposable and then get rid of them as soon as you don't need them. And automation is key here. You can leverage AWS CloudFormation or other automation techniques to make the turn off unused instances bit automatic. Here's a customer of mine who uses this strategy to save money. And you can see in the EC2 usage graph here how you can identify the weekdays, you can identify the weekends, and you can identify even the end of vacation season based on the usage that you see in this graph. And this customer here, they were able to save 35% of EC2 costs just by turning off developer, test, and QA instances. Huge cost-saving potential here. If you want to bring the turn off unused instances thing to a new level, of course, you can use auto scaling. So let's take a small poll. Who uses auto scaling already in this room? Okay, please keep your hands raised. If you didn't raise your hand, find the nearest hand that gone up, and after this talk, ask them about their experience with auto scaling. And uh, yeah, feel free to, to mingle, to, to exchange experiences, even during the party. So, uh, Auto scaling is the number one way to make instance saving automatic. So auto scaling works by managing the number of instances that you devote to some piece of your architecture. In this example here, we are using web servers that are managed through auto scaling. And auto scaling will make sure that if you need more web servers, those are going to be provisioned automatically. But if you don't need that many web servers, they will be shut down automatically, and then you will save money because you're not going to use those excess web servers. Here's how easy you can set up an auto-scaling group. This is an example using AWS CloudFormation, and this piece of code here describes a launch configuration. A launch configuration is a recipe for auto-scaling that tells it everything that it needs to know to start a new instance. And then using this launch configuration, you can set up an auto-scaling group, which is that group of web servers, application servers, or whatever you are using here. And you can choose parameters. You can choose availability zones, what's the minimum, the maximum size of your group, and uh, other parameters here. So with these two pieces of code, you can automate the creation of auto-scaling groups and therefore automate saving money by turning off unused instances. And that essentially means that you can much better align resources with demand. As demand goes up, you get more instances, but if demand goes down, instances are being turned off automatically for you, and then you get to save a lot of money. So let me introduce you to Mimi Jiang from Adobe, and she's going to tell you about their experience in saving money and their strategies that they used to save money at Adobe. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, hi, everyone. Wow. I'm back at the event here. Wait a minute. Let's just wait oh. to get the microphone going. <laughs> Battery died, great. So, so he's auto scaling her microphone now. <laughs> <laughs> so, quick applause to the AV guy, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Can you guys hear me now? No. Okay. Wait just a minute and. All right. Yay. That's a lot better. Okay, great. I hope everybody is enjoying the conference, the sessions. Um, so uh, my name is Mimi Jain. I work with Adobe Systems. I've been with the company for about four years, and currently I'm leading performance and reliability initiatives on the API platform team, which you'll hear about. Um, so how many of you in the audience have used Adobe products, Photoshop, in design. Wow, that's a lot. Thank you. Thank you for being our customers. So if you've been with us the last three or so years, you must have seen the major transformation for us to move into the cloud. Our business is now powered by two major clouds. Creative Cloud, which is a subscription-based service for the creatives. That's where, the, where Photoshop, Illustrator, and all those products live. And Marketing Cloud, which provides a set of solutions for marketers to provide a better experience for their customers. So we do a lot of social media, a lot of analytics, um, provide those solutions to the marketers. Um, so, so Adobe um, is a design company, as you know, and we have been moving to the cloud. And one thing that we really like about the cloud is that and it's become the new norm, just as Andy said yesterday, that, that, that resources are available on demand. So it's kind of like just, as Constantine pointed out, it's like a light switch, right? You can turn it on when you need it or turn it off when you're done with it, right? So it's, it's, it's there when you need it. So I'm gonna be talking to you today about some of the techniques that our team, the API platform team at Adobe, has used to optimize on cost in AWS. So Adobe is accelerating innovation in the digital media and digital marketing spaces. And in the, this year, we have announced a few product offerings. In the first part of the year, we announced the Ink and Slide, two digital accessories that make drawing on the iPad more rich and smoother. And last month at our annual conference, Adobe Max, we announced a uh, beta version of our product, the Adobe Creative SDK. Okay, Curtis, take me out. This always happens to me, every presentation <laughs> I do. <laughs> All right, it's a lot better, thank you. Um, so I was talking about the Creative SDK, which has opened doors for third-party developers to create mobile applications that work with the ink and slide, and Photoshop editing features and product components in the form of microservices. So what's powering this capability? And it's the API platform. The API platform connects the mobile applications to the product features that are offered as API services. The three components of the API platform, including the gateway, the console, the management services, provide a secure and performant experience for developers to interact with the Adobe API libraries. This platform was started only a year ago. And at the time, it was an idea that our team was whiteboarding. And today, we're processing over a billion requests a day on the API gateway. The growth has been phenomenal. And we could not have done it without the agility and speed to market offered by AWS. We're fully deployed in AWS in four distinct regions. We're using AWS's Route 53 to route traffic between these regions. 
We're also in a VPC environment with private subnets and, and public subnets. We have a fleet of Nginx web servers running in the public subnet, and it's fronted by load, an elastic load balancer that distributes traffic between two availability zones. We have uh, RDS for MySQL in the private subnet, along with other services such as CloudFront uh, for content distribution, Elastic Cache for Redis, and S3. So this is our deployment ar architecture as it stands now, but it's actually gone through many iterations since we started. And just as Constantine pointed out, the cloud gives you the ability to continuously iterate until you get to a lean architecture. And that is what we did. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we iterate it through the cycle of architecting, building, monitoring, and repeating that cycle. So the first thing I want to talk about is instance type sizing. And we follow a step, a, a set of steps to do that. Right? To get the most out of EC2, it's so important to pick the most optimal instance type. The steps that we go through our first, we look at our application characteristics. The usage profile, is the application CPU driven, memory bound? What are the characteristics? And then we pick out instance types from the pool of instances that are available in AWS. And we do further analysis, benchmarking to figure out from a cost perspective, from performance perspective, resiliency perspective, what is the most optimal instance type for us? There are five major families that AWS offers, from general purpose to CPU optimized to GPU instances. And in each family, there are different size instance types, from micro to large, all the way to eight extra large. So I'll walk you through a use case of ours and how we selected an instance type. So the use case was we're, we needed an API gateway to run Nginx web servers. And its job is to proxy API calls from the mobile applications to the backend services. The application has a few characteristics, CPU intensive, has minimum of eight uh, cores, it requires eight uh, CPU cores, and it, support, it needs to support heavy payloads. So we picked out three instance types from AWS, and two of those instance types are CPU um, optimized, so we wanted to compare the different sizes. And we also picked out a general purpose instance type, and that is just to compare the two families between general purpose and CPU optimized family. First, we did a performance analysis. We took two test cases, uh, two usage scenarios from our application, and the first test is to look at CPU utilization. So at what point do these instance types max out on CPU? And we compared also how many of the smaller instances would match the capacity of the large instance, which was the eight extra large. And the second test we ran was focused around network bandwidth. We wanted to know what network bandwidth we had on these instances and also how they compare to each other. Just from a performance perspective alone, the CC2 eight extra large was the best choice. But we have to look at two other variables, cost and resiliency. On the cost analysis, we compare the monthly cost of the instance types and compare them to the tar different tar uh, throughput targets. And at a certain point, we found that the M3 2 extra large from the general purpose family actually cost more than the 8 extra large in the compute optimized family. And what made the most sense for us was the C3 extra large that was the least expensive. So from both performance and cost perspectives, the C3 to extra large was the most optimal choice. But we still have one more variable to look at. So Amazon CTO Warner Vogel put it really well. Everything fails all the time. So at some point, you will have failure in your infrastructure whether because it's a hardware issue or natural disaster that's taking down a whole availability zone, there will be failure. So as you're architecting, you have to keep that in mind and architect appropriately. So yesterday, I attended a session uh, by Netflix, and they talked about microservices. And one of the things the guy said was, there, there was a quote from Benjamin Franklin. Um, there are two things you cannot avoid in life, and they're death and taxes. 
but he added outages in production to the list. <laughs> so I thought that was really interesting. Um, definitely think about resiliency as you're architecting. And from in, in the perspective of selecting instances, there's a choice between fewer large instances and, smaller, and, and more smaller instances. Which is more resilient? And from our analysis, the conclusion is the latter is better because the traffic is now more widely distributed mm -hmm. onto the smaller instance types. With the large instance, because each instance is taking too much, a, a lot more traffic, if it goes down, it creates more burden for the other instances. And that could actually cause downtime. So from a resiliency standpoint, running smaller instances is actually a better choice than large ones. So we went with the C3 to extra large. Um, and there were a couple of other learnings we had from this exercise, uh, just to name a few. Uh, first, understand your application characteristics and know your expected workload. And then based on these two factors, pick the instance type that really matters. And then also, Enhanced networking is a big thing. If, you're, if, if your application requires a lot of uh, network bandwidth, turn on network, uh, enhanced networking. It's available on certain instance types. If you pick one from the, any of those optimized families, the enhanced networking is a great feature. And it's free. Why not turn it on? And finally, I want to mention that the instance type varies by region in terms of cost and availability. So the instance type cost is different, and the same instance type may not be available in all the regions. So just be aware of that as you're selecting instance types. Now that you have built your base infrastructure, it's time to think about how to handle the temporary and the unexpected workload. Mm -hmm. So Constantine talked about auto-scaling. And I'm going to cover that as well. But there are two other scaling mechanisms, event-based scaling as well as schedule-based scaling. Event-based scaling is meant for major events, major launches, just like the conference we had last month, Adobe Max. And at Adobe Max, we, were, and we announced product offerings. So we were expecting some spikes in traffic. So we over-provisioned our infrastructure. We scaled up our instances ahead of time. But one thing to note here is that you have to pre-warm the ELB. If you're using the elastic load balancer, that's the entryway to your EC2 instances. If that's not pre-warmed, you're not going to be able to use all the capacity from the EC2 instances. So you need to do both. And after the event, observe the traffic. And if you see any unused capacity, scale down appropriately. Don't waste resources if they're not being used. Another type of scaling is schedule-based scaling. So we look at the different traffic patterns throughout the day, weekends versus weekdays, holidays. Anytime there's a drop in traffic, that's our opportunity to optimize on cost. That's when we scale down. And we scale down non-production environments, such as dev and test. So as an example, we have a QE environment where we do load testing. So when we're not testing, there's no need to keep it on. So Constantine talked about auto-scaling. I just want to touch on it a little bit more and talk to you about how we use it. Um, we feel that auto-scaling is really good for less steep traffic increases. The big spikes, um, we use event-based scaling for those. But the less steep traffic increases, auto-scaling auto is the best candidate. And one key takeaway is that we scale up fast and scale down slow. Scaling fast means that you set a threshold that's low enough to give you your existing instances room to take on the extra demand while you spin up instances. Because remember, as you're spinning, spinning up new instances, it takes time. So during the five minutes, 10 minutes, you need to have enough capacity to handle the extra load. So don't wait until your CPU is choking in 90% to scale up. Do it at maybe 60%, 70%. Scale down slow. So one thing to note here is you're paying by the hour. So there's no need to rush into scaling down you know, five minutes into, into this instance being up. You can wait the extra 20, 30 minutes. And scaling down too fast sometimes will put you in a flapping situation because you, maybe you have a scale up event happening at the same time. And then set triggers. Set triggers to align with your application characteristics, whether a CPU, network, just make sure that you're scaling effectively. 
And one more tip for you, avoid um, multiple scaling triggers. If you have to have multiple scaling triggers, be very, very careful, because these triggers could conflict each other. A good example is that you may want to scale up when your CPU hits 70%, and then you have, maybe you have a network trigger that's low, that, that's, that hits the low threshold, which will make your, your auto scaling to scale down. So then you have a scale up and scale down happening sort of at the same time. So just be very careful when you set up multiple triggers. Here's an example of, here's an example of um, our auto scaling policy. So we scale up two instances when CPU goes above 70% for two minutes, and we scale down when the CPU goes below 40% for 20 minutes. Notice the difference in timing. And we also have a cooldown of 300 seconds. So we scale up and down two instances because we run in two availability zones. So we always want to make sure that the AZs are balanced. Now that you've set up your infrastructure, the next thing to, to look at is monitoring. And monitoring is really important because it helps you validate your decisions. And the monitoring gives you data points on how you can iterate the architecting and the, and, and the running steps of the cycle. And one thing to note here is that your monitoring strategy should align with your application characteristics. Identify the key metrics that, you, you, that are relevant to your application to monitor. And don't just monitor cost. Right? You should also be looking at how your infrastructure is utilized, because the utilization drives cost. Tagging, Constantine touched on this. Tag your instances is actually a very powerful feature in AWS. Tag your instances with environment, owner, cost center to help you slice and dice your reporting data. And establish actionable alerts. These alerts will tell you when there's a change in your environment. Whether it's a cost change, whether it's a usage change, you want to be aware of it so you can take action appropriately. So you're collecting all this data from your, your monitors. Right? And based on this data, you can iterate your architecture. Based on this data, you can adjust your resource usage. And for all of these techniques, don't try to do it yourself. Tools will make life a lot easier. So Constantine is going to talk about the AWS tools that will help you. And I'll cover a couple of other tools that we use at Adobe. One of them is Netflix ICE. It's an open source tool, and we use it to manage usage and cost across the whole enterprise because it tracks account information, regions, instance types, on demand versus reserved instances, spot instances, gives a really um, good overview of how the, it, the, uh, the resources are utilized. So check it out, it's available on, on GitHub. Cloudability is another cost management tool that we use. And Cloudability offers some really powerful reporting capabilities. And a couple of examples I want to point out are usage comparison report is really good because it allows you to look at your usage between two different time periods and what has changed during, during the, time, the, the time difference. And underutilized instances are, are great. This report shows you the instances that are not being efficiently utilized based on the criteria that you set. So you should really look at which instances are underutilized, whether they're still needed, so that you can either turn them off or resize the instance type. Just to recap what we discussed today, we talked about cost performance and resiliency having equal weight. And you need to evaluate all of them when you select an instance type. Embrace failure because it's going to occur. Plan and design for it. And turn off unused instances. And, and it's best to automate it. It's like a light switch. When you walk out of a room, you turn off the lights. So do the same with compute infrastructure. Auto scaling is very powerful. But use it wisely. Test it to make sure that that gives you the behavior that you expect. Monitor and frequently evolve your architecture. Amazon gives you the ability to evolve your architecture, to iterate as many times as you need to until you get it right. So take advantage of it. In closing, I just want to say that Amazon has built these building blocks for us to build our infrastructure around. It's really up to us on how we want to put the building blocks together to maximize efficiency and cost savings. And I want to thank Amazon for giving us these building blocks and 
they have truly revolutionized the compute infrastructure. Thank you, and I also want to point out that there is another session uh, from one of our principal architects at Adobe right after this. So if you're interested in learning more about Adobe, check it out. And there was a session yesterday um, on cloud management, cost management in cl using cloudability. Uh, if you missed it, you can find it on YouTube. And thank you. You can con contact me um, at my email address, and I'll be around after the session if you have any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Constantine. OK, so we learned about turning off instances. We learned about auto scaling. But we can also look at different cost models at AWS. And one of them is to use reserved instances. You can take uh, advantage of reserved instances to save a lot of money. Reserved instances mean you pay a small upfront price for reserving your instance for a one or three year term. And then you get to enjoy a much lower hourly price. And some people think that one year or three years is maybe a long time to commit to some usage. But the reality is that you can see the break even in terms of cost much earlier. So for a one year reserved instance, the break even could occur at five months. And for a three year RI, you can see a break even as early as eight months into the, its usage. So it is. Uh, worth checking out, maybe putting together your Excel sheet or talking to your account manager. He can analyze your uh, current usage and give you a report on where you can save money by using reserved instances. Or remember the Trusted, trusted Advisor tool, which will give you an RI analysis as well. Reserved instances are flexible. That means you can move them between availability zones. You can move them between the EC2 Classic and the VPC platforms. You can even change their size by converting larger instances into many smaller instances in terms of reservations. So they're really a flexible tool to help you save cost here. Now, when looking at different pricing models, it's always worth out checking out spot instances. These are my one favorite feature of all of this pricing models. I use my personal instances are all spot instances. So let's take another poll. Who is using spot instances already? OK. Yeah, it's not enough. You need to use more spot instances. Why? So imagine when you, when you look at the AWS infrastructure, we operate massive amounts of hardware because we want to make sure that whenever you, you want to use an instance, you always get it. That means that we carry around a big headroom of unused instances ourselves. So to be more efficient, we sell those unused instances on the spot market, which works kind of like the, the, the stock market, right? So the pricing for spot instances is based on supply and demand. If there are not enough people using our capacity, we can offer a lot of excess instances for sale on the spot market, and you get to decide what price you're willing to pay. So with spot instances, you set the maximum price that you want to pay for the instance, and that price can be much lower than the regular on-demand price. And if the capacity is there, we are going to fulfill that request because we have excess capacity. And so the price, the current price of spot instances becomes a function of supply and demand, which can really look like uh, a stock ticker or something like that. So the rules are, you get your instance as soon as the price meets your maximum price or is below your maximum price. But if the price crosses the threshold of your maximum price and becomes bigger than that, your instance is going to be terminated. Now, people get really nervous. Wait a minute. Is he talking about terminating my instance without me knowing it? Well, yes. But remember Mimi? <laughs> remember what she said? Remember what Werner said? Everything fails all the time. So just treat the instance termination due to crossing the maximum price as another failure. And it turns out that the instance price can vary between availability zones. So this is an example graph of the historic price of, reserved, uh, sorry, of uh, spot instances. And you can check out the price for the last 60 days and analyze the pricing here. And you will notice that the different colors here, they relate to different availability zones. And you will see that the price, in this example, the regular price would have been 24 cents. And most of the time, the price here is a fraction of that price. It's actually only 11.7% of the on-demand price. So that means whenever you get to use those instances, you just pay 12% of the on-demand price, which is almost nothing. But you can also see that sometimes supply goes back, demand becomes high, and then the price goes up a lot. So the price can even become higher than on-demand. 
So to mitigate against that, you always need to figure out what is the right price I'm willing to set here. And you can use things like auto-scaling to automatically turn on instances in a different availability zone if one, instance, if one availability zone becomes too expensive for you. So it's a very dynamic pricing model, but if you invest a little bit more brain power here, you can save a lot of money. You can even save as much as 80 to 90% cost. There are some risks, but you need to prepare for risks anyway. And so it, it becomes second nature to accept spot instances as if they were normal, normal instances because you can always react with this. And leverage auto-scaling to manage your spot instances fleet. And I recognize that sometimes it can be a challenge to react against the unexpected termination of spot instances. So to help make your life a lot easier, I'm very glad to announce, pre-announce, that the spot team is working on a new feature which will allow you to get a two-minute warning before the instance gets terminated. I always wanted to say something like this. So. <laughs> so thank you to the spot team, and thank you. In a, couple of, in a couple of weeks, you will see an announcement where you will be able to enjoy a two-minute warning before the instance gets terminated. This gives you enough time to save everything, to migrate over to a different availability zone, and to mitigate against the cancellation of spot instances. I don't have any specifics that I can share with you, but it's going to be quite easy, yes. OK, so let's move on to storage here. There are some ways on how to save money with uh, S3 and, and storage classes. You may remember that S3 comes with different storage classes that you can choose for your S3 objects. So the regular storage class gives you 11 nines durability. But sometimes you want to store something that isn't that important or that, or that you can easily uh, recreate, such as pictures that come out of a CMS and that you just want to store as static content on S3. And for those kind of objects, you can leverage the reduced redundancy storage class, which will instantly save you 20% on your S3 bill for all those objects that are easily reproducible. And you can even subscribe to SNS notifications so that you can notice that if an object gets lost because of the lower redundancy, you can always replace it easily and automatically. Another great opportunity here is to leverage the Amazon Glacier storage class. Sometimes you would save something on S3, such as log files, that after some time, you don't necessarily want to look at them that often. So this could be archiving data, this could be old log files, this could be old backups that you don't plan to use, but that you feel uncomfortable really deleting them for sure. So you can move them into the Glacier storage class, which will reduce the storage price by a factor of, of uh, by 64%. So that means that you get to store these things very, very cheaply. And since you're not going to plan to use them very quickly, you can live with the three to five hours restore time that the Glacier storage class gives you. And you can leverage lifecycle rules to automatically move objects that are old enough into the Glacier storage class so that you don't have to do it by hand. So that will automatically save money on those objects that are old and that you don't plan to use that often. OK, let's move on to DynamoDB. So you may recall that DynamoDB pricing is based on capacity units. So you provision capacity units to your DynamoDB tables, and then the price is based on how many capacity units you allocate. So you can optimize around the capacity unit usage here. And there are some very good guidelines in the documentation that help you optimize CUs here. But there's always a, a, a trade-off to make here. You need to understand how much capacity units you really need, and you need to prepare for peaks, and you also need to constantly monitor and adjust here. And here are some strategies that make life easier for you if you're using DynamoDB. So first of all, it always pays off to cache stuff. So if you can introduce caching into your architecture, then you will offload traffic from DynamoDB, and that will help you save capacity units on the DynamoDB side. Of course, there's some cost to caching, but sometimes you have RAM on your application servers anyway. So you can use the excess RAM on your machines to cache stuff locally and thereby reduce the load on the DynamoDB table, and that means you get to live with lower amount of capacity units. And there are other strategies you can use. You can use multiple tables with multiple capacity unit settings based on how much you access those tables. So don't be afraid to have a lot of tables that are optimized for their own capacity usage. You can use compression to save capacity units here. 
And also, you can use strategies like SQS to buffer over capacity writes. This is a very popular strategy that Shazam pioneered, uh, I think, uh, two years ago. That means if you didn't provide enough capacity units to DynamoDB, and you will start seeing capacity errors, then you can just retry that writes into, or write those writes into an SQS queue. And then after the usage goes down and you get more capacity units back because they're not used that much, you can retry those writes after the fact by using some machine that just reads messages from SQS and retries those writes on DynamoDB. So then effectively allows you to use SQS as a buffer in front of the write request to your database. And that means that you only need to provision the, the average amount of capacity units to the DynamoDB tables. You don't have to provision for peak you can get away with provisioning for average capacity, saving you money on the DynamoDB side. There is another session that I just came out of, which is called So You Think You Can Architect. You can watch this session on YouTube. And this is where we make a very creative use of this strategy here. There is a script on GitHub called Dynamic DynamoDB. And think of this as auto-scaling for DynamoDB capacity units. This is a great strategy. It's a script that you just need to run, and it will automatically adjust capacity units over time as it measures your load and calculates the right amount of capacity unit and adjusts the capacity units just like an auto-scaling group. Here's an example from one of my customers. In the beginning, they were just using DynamoDB, and they added capacity units and added some more capacity units and more. And, and then they figured, wait a minute, our DynamoDB bill is starting to become pretty large now. So they looked hard at optimizations and caching strategies, and they were able to save 80% of their capacity units just through some optimization on the use of capacity units. So that's a break, big potential. And then I, they found out about the dynamic DynamoDB script, and after they used that, they saved another 20% on top of that. You can see that this is just, this is really the effect of those two things, those two strategies, because when they did a cache flush and they had to repopulate everything, there's a huge peak that shows that this usage continued going up altogether. They were just much more smarter, much more efficient in using DynamoDB after that. Okay, and now the seventh step you can take is, you can offload your architecture. You don't have to use all of your architecture all the time. You can offload some of this work to some other services that may be more efficient. So for instance, there are three ways to offload. You can use Amazon CloudFront in front of your web architecture to offload some of the traffic so that you can get away with a smaller architecture behind CloudFront. You can introduce caching. Again, it's a great strategy in front of any database, not just limited to DynamoDB. Or you can leverage existing Amazon Web Services that already implemented a lot of the stuff that you may have running on your own now. So here's an example on CloudFront that you can put in front of your web architecture. CloudFront will cache your static and dynamic traffic. So it also pays off, even if you have a 100% dynamic web service, it could be a real-time whatever API something, it still pays off to use CloudFront in front of that because your calls might have a time to live of five seconds or even one minute. And this is, some, this is enough for CloudFront to cache for you so that you can scale down the architecture behind CloudFront and save money. You can offload the database part of your architecture through caching. So by adding caches in front of the database, you can get away with a smaller database size. And that is a good trade-off most of the time if you encounter some read-heavy loads that uh, give you an opportunity to, to save money here. And also, take a look at all of these services that we accumulated over time. It may be a little bit confusing to look at all of these services, but there may be some pieces that you can reuse in the architecture that save you the trouble of implementing them yourself. You don't have to implement your own RabbitMQ server if you can just use SQS. You don't have to run uh, your own search engine. You can just use Cloud Search. You don't have to set up your own database or your own Redis cluster, you can just use ElastiCache or RDS for running the database. Because whenever you can leverage one of those pre-cooked services from AWS, chances are very good that we found a way to make this more efficient and thereby easier and also more cost efficient and cheaper to use than if you were rolling out your own service. Great, so let's 
take a brief look at cost monitoring and analysis. This is really a reminder of things that you should know about already. Check out the AWS TCO calculator, especially if you're migrating something from on-premises to the cloud. This is a great tool to get a real-life apples-to-apples comparison look on the TCO of something running on-premises versus running in the cloud. Check out the AWS Simple Monthly Calculator if you want to get a cost projection into the next uh, few weeks and figure out what it, how, many, how much money you need to allocate for the coming months. It is not that simple anymore because we added a lot of services to it, but it is a really good tool to get a better feel on, on cost. There's the AWS Billing Console, which shows you really nicely where the big chunks of your bills are so that you know what to optimize next. So in this case, in this example, Redshift is a big chunk here. So maybe we should take a closer look at Redshift here or take a closer look at the next biggest, which is EC2 usage. Check out the AWS Cost Explorer that will give you a trend across many months around where are the trends in your architecture. Is my EC2 bill growing or is it shrinking over time? If it's growing, is it growing in line with the rest of my architecture? Or is there something that makes my EC2 or S3 or whatever bill grow faster than the rest? And why is it so? So this is a great analysis tool here as well. And then you can always set up AWS billing alerts. That means that you can get, you can get a notification, an automatic notification via email or SNS about when your bill is hitting some cost target that you don't want to, to go beyond. You can even use this as part of auto scaling. You can shut down instances automatically if your, if your bill reaches a certain level or something like that. So it's really, it's, it uses the same mechanisms. So let's recap. These are the seven strategies you can use to improve your architecture and make it more cost efficient. Turn off unused instances. Automate the turning off by using auto scaling. Use reserved instances. And if you want to be a bit more sophisticated, check out spot instances. It's a great way to save money. Leverage different S3 storage classes and optimize your DynamoDB usage by being really smart about how you allocate those capacity units and how you use DynamoDB. And finally, find ways to offload pieces of your architecture into pre-cooked AWS services. Remember to iterate. You're no longer confined to hardware that you bought and that you have to live with. You have a completely dynamic architecture to play with where you can optimize all the time while you architect, build, and monitor your stuff. So with that, thank you very much for coming here. And I hope that this talk helped you save a lot of money. Thank you. <laughs>